Uh, it's true. My name's Robert, and I run the Brunel Museum, which is next door to this wonderful Aladdin's cave of a building. And um, I'd like to talk about Brunel. I'd like to talk about Rotherhithe. And I'd like to talk about the Brunel Museum in Rotherhithe. And if you haven't heard of Brunel, then he was French. Uh, he's, uh, he's a refugee. He's uh, uh, an immigrant. He is one of many immigrants to this country that come here with wonderful ideas and with inspiring ideas and uh, uh, an immigrant who changed London forever and for the better. Uh, the Brunel you may have heard of is Isambard Kingdom Brunel, little man, big hat, big cigar, big chains, big ideas. Um, you can perhaps picture the photograph standing in front of the chains, uh, huge chains, which he used to launch his last great ship. He built the biggest ship in the world three times. He built the first tunnel under a river anywhere in the world. He built the fastest railway in the world. He built 150 bridges. He built two dock systems. And he died age 53. He was a polymath and he was prolific. And we are redefining prolific when we look at what he achieved. This is Isambard Kingdom Brunel our second greatest Britain in the BBC poll. But I'd like to start by talking about <coughs> his father, Sir Mark Brunel, the immigrant. Mark Brunel, uh, a genius, some say a greater genius than his better known son. Mark Brunel uh, is a royalist, and a royalist in France in the 1780s which is a very bad time indeed to be a royalist in France. He flees America on the good ship Liberty. He arrives in New York. He becomes chief engineer of the port. He defines and designs the defences on Staten Island. He makes plans for the first canal into, uh, in North America. And he wins a competition for the design of the Capitol building in Washington. But before he fled France, he met an English girl. And he fell in love. And uh, he left a thriving career in America to find her and woo her and marry her. He came to England. He finds a young woman. Her name is Sophia Kingdom. And that is why our most famous engineer has that big name. Little man, big hat, big cigar big chains, big ideas, big name. And um, Mark Brunel, interestingly, given what we've just heard about, Mark Brunel uh, not only built the first tunnel under a river anywhere in the world, and it's just over there, and it is the oldest tunnel in the London Underground. It is the beginning of the technology that changed the shape of our cities worldwide. He not only did that, but he came to England not just to find the woman he loved, but with an idea. And his idea was mass production. He brought his idea to England because at the time England had the biggest navy in the world. And his idea was to mass produce, this is uh, the, first, the first conveyor belt system, to mass produce the pulley blocks um, that lift and lower the sails in, in the big ships in the Navy. And when he arrived in England, uh, which has the biggest Navy in the world, the Admiralty has 150 skilled craftsmen building uh, by hand pulley blocks to bring up and pull down the, sh the sails in the ships. And what Marc Brunel does, this genius Frenchman, what Marc Brunel does, this immigrant with a wonderful and extraordinary and transformational idea, what he does is he automates, automates production of that system. He designs eight um, self-monitoring machines. Uh, he splits 
the process into eight discrete tasks. He builds machines that are self-correcting and self-monitoring. And he produces, with this new system of machines, intelligent machines, the first um, mass production system. He produces um, more blocks, more cheaply, and with 30 unskilled laborers. So we've moved from 150 skilled craftsmen to 30 unskilled laborers. And this is the very first example of uh, mass production. And um, the interesting thing about that story, of course, is you look at the satisfied British Navy with more blocks and more cheaply produced and better produced, but we forget the 30 skilled craftsmen who are now without employment. And I suppose when we look at technology, uh, as we've just heard, we need to think about the human aspects of it all. So this is Mark Brunel, who automates productions for the biggest navy in the world. And this is Mark Brunel, who next door builds a tunnel under a river for the first time anywhere in the world. Mark Brunel and his famous son, Isambard Kingdom Brunel, reckon it will take three years to dig under the River Thames to Wapping. He builds a new machine, and he calls it his Tirado, uh, Tirado Navalis. This is uh, it's a small creature. It's Well, his isn't. It's, it's huge, but his design is based on a small creature called a Tirado Navalis, which is a woodworm in ships. And there are more ships at the bottom of the ocean by action of the Teredo, the woodworm in the ship, than by the action of the enemy. And the Teredo is half worm, half mollusk. And the mollusk moves the shell at the front to wear away the timber, which it then ingests. And then it lines the tunnel as it moves forwards. This is another wonderful example of how a brilliant, brilliant mind has found uh, an inspirational idea from nature. This is why he called his tunnel boring machine, we call them <coughs> TBMs today in their honeycombing cities all over the world, he called his tunnel boring machine a Teredo after this little mollusk. And this is the machine that built the first tunnel under a river anywhere in the world, here in Rotherhithe. Brunel, father and son, thought it would take three years. It took 18 years. Men grew old and died building this tunnel. They suffered from all kinds of complaints because whilst uh, Brunel built the machine, uh, he hadn't yet worked out how to automate it completely. People died here from what they call tunnel sickness. Uh, which was, um, well, the, 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 the symptoms are uh, respiratory failure, uh, blindness, temporary or permanent, um, madness, temporary or permanent, and uh, nice detail, uh, rotting fingernails. So it's an unpleasant job. It's the worst job in the world. But uh, working in appalling conditions in this new semi-automated machine Brunel's workers inch their way under the River Thames to Wapping. It takes them 18 years. They build, the first, they build the first tunnel under a river anywhere in the world. And it is now moving millions of people every year through the tunnel under the River Thames um, on the London Overground. Brunel designed it, he conceived of it, as a tunnel for moving cargo by horse and by cart under the biggest, biggest traffic jam in the world. So this is a, um, a cargo tunnel. But they ran out of money. He builds a brilliant machine, but not everything works as smoothly as he hoped. Um, it takes 18 years to build. People are dying of uh, tunnel sickness and the, uh, and the symptoms, which are more than unpleasant. Um, and he is forced, and this is unusual, I think, in obsessives. He is forced, when things go a little wrong, to improvise. And I think he's as genius an improviser 
as he is an engineer. He organises the world's first underwater public relations event. And after the first flood, the tunnel floods five times, after the first flood, he organises a banquet underneath the River Thames, just a few paces from here. And the great and the good feast underneath the River Thames off silver plates and drink from crystal glass in the world's first underwater dinner party. And he organises entertainment. The band of the Coldstream Guards play patriotic music as the diners feast under the river. Now, the band of the Coldstream Guards are quite noisy above ground. <laughs> what it must be like to go to a dinner party in a cave under a river where a regimental band is billed to play patriotic music, none of us, thankfully, will ever know. <laughs> and it's not clear how good the food was either, but as a piece of public relations, it is brilliant. If it is safe enough to have a dinner party under the Thames, it is safe enough for you, as potential investors, to take up a second subscription of shares and give the Brunels the money to resume the work. And that's what happens. It's very classy fundraising. Unfortunately, 12 weeks after the fabulous banquet under the river, the world's first underwater PR event, this genius inventor who is also given to outlandish improvisation, 12 weeks later, the tunnel floods again, six men drown, and Isambard Kingdom Brunel, the little man with the big hat, with the big cigar, with the big chains, <coughs> and the big name, uh, is almost drowned in the underground chamber just over there. And he's uh, rescued and sent more dead than alive to Bristol, to Congolese, where he resumes his career and builds the uh, fastest railway in the world, the biggest ship in the world, and so on and so forth. But our most famous engineer began here, here in Rotherhithe. The underwater banquet is not the strangest thing that happened under the River Thames. Uh, it opened in 1843 not as a cargo tunnel, they ran out of money. It opened as an underwater shopping arcade. And if you take the train from here to Wapping, despite the reflection in the glass of the carriages, you can see the empty shops where they sold Thames Tunnel souvenirs. Thames Tunnel gin flasks. Thames Tunnel pin cushions, Thames Tunnel snuff boxes, Thames Tunnel coffee cups, Thames Tunnel cigar cutters, Thames Tunnel fridge magnets, Thames Tunnel mobile phone cases, Thames Tunnel Game Boys, Thames Tunnel robots, Thames Tunnel. It is a very early example of what is technically known as aggressive marketing of site-specific merchandise. This brilliant engineer this brilliant improviser is also a salesman and a showman. And the shops do a very brisk trade. They, um, they do a brisk trade because next door in the 1840s was the world's most popular visitor attraction. When it opened in 1843, on the first day in March, 50,000 people filed down the staircase and walked under the River Thames for the purpose of turning round and walking back again. In the first three months, there were a million visitors. Now, that's a lot of people. In 1843, that is half the population of London. In 1843, London is the biggest city in the world. Without a word of exaggeration, next door to this wonderful building was the world's most popular visitor attraction. Built by the world's most genius showman, improviser and engineer and his flamboyant son. And then it became an underwater fairground. And where the trains now run, there were sword swallowers, fire eaters, magicians. 
Ethiopian serenaders, Indian dancers, Chinese singers, tightrope walkers, dancing horses. A whole section of the tunnel was decorated as a ballroom and a steam-powered musical organ played waltzes under the Thames. This was the best party in London. And it was thrown by an engineer and his engineer's son, by an improviser, by a genius, by a man who was not only organised and mechanical, but flamboyant at the same time. And I'm talking about all this because what I want to talk about, as well as Brunel, is Rotherhithe and the spirit of Rotherhithe. This is a crossing point. The Thames Tunnel is a crossing point. Rotherhithe, it's Saxon. Rother means cattle, Hyde means harbour. They used to drive cattle across the river here. This is one of those places in the world where you arrive and depart. This is a crossing point. And the interesting thing about Brunel is having made this extraordinary crossing from France to America, the land of the free, and from America to England with his multi-billion dollar idea, he builds another machine for more crossings. And the other thing I have to mention, though it's not particularly in my brief at the Brunel Museum, is this is not just a place for crossing rivers. This is a place for crossing oceans. And it was here in 1620 that the pilgrims sailed and sailed for the New World via Southampton, via Plymouth to Massachusetts. And because they're doing the journey before Brunel, they're doing it by sail. And they sail from here, and they are not, remember, some kind of bunch of crazy rene renegade reclusives. They are um, brilliant people. They are exciting people with a very idiosyncratic uh, and, and very creative ideas. They are moving to make a better life, and the point of departure is here. Rotherhithe was and is a crossing point and a point of arrival and departure for genius French engineers escaping the revolution or for religious idiosyncrasies, people who want to go to a new world and make a new life in Massachusetts. They sail from Rotherhithe against the prevailing winds, against the prevailing currents, and it takes them 10 weeks to get to Massachusetts. 100, 200, 230 years later, Mark Brunel's genius son builds the first steamship to cross the Atlantic, the Great Western. Paddington was never destination Bristol, Paddington was destination New York. And Isambard King of Brunel builds the first steamship to cross the Atlantic and it does it not in 10 weeks, but in 10 days. Now this isn't shrinking the world, it's shattering it. And if his father mass-produced pulley blocks for sailing ships, his, the son put the sailing ships out of business and heralded a new dawn in communication and transport. And just down the river from here, Brunel, by the way, always lived in London. He's thought of as a Bristol man, but he always lived in London. There is more Brunel in London than in Bristol. Just down the river from here, Isambard Kingdom Brunel built the biggest ship in the world again. Six times bigger than anything else afloat. A ship big enough to carry coal to steam from England to Australia and back again <coughs> without refuelling. Six times bigger than anything else afloat. And the first luxury passenger liner. Um, the Great Britain, which is Brunel's famous ship built in Bristol, could carry 350 passengers. The ship he built in London could carry 4,000. 
The Great Eastern is carrying more passengers than any ship at the time by a factor of 10 or more. This is the ship that changed everything. Uh, I've just come back from a transatlantic voyage. I sing for my supper. I talk about the Mayflower. I talk about Brunel's ship. The ship that I have just crossed the Atlantic in was carrying 3,000 passengers. Three quarters of the number that Isambard Kingdom Brunel's ship was built to take 150 years ago. These are extraordinary. These are not leaps in technology and understanding. These are bounds and somersaults. Uh, that's Brunel and that's Rotherhithe a crossing point, a place of arrival and departure, a very exciting place to be and a very exciting place to arrive at and a very exciting place to leave from. But I need to finish by talking about museums because I run a very small museum next door to this wonderful building, a very small museum with a very big story. And I want to remind you what a museum is. A museum is a house of the muses. That's what museum means. You perhaps thought a museum was this old fusty building where things in cases were looked on by old fusty people. <laughs> a museum is a house of the muses. A museum is a house of inspiration. And there are nine muses. And one of them is theatre. And one of them is music. And one of them is history. And one of them is poetry. And one of them is heroic poetry. And I can't remember the other four, but you can make up your own. The important thing is that museums are places to get excited. And that's what a good museum should hope for in this exciting little borough of London. A very historic borough. This has been a crossing point for hundreds of years, and long may it continue, and long may people remember Isambard Kingdom Brunel. Thank you very much.